when we last saw Clamidomonas, they were mating gametes, cells of opposite mating types, get together, sticking by the tips of their flagella and then zippering up. The plus type makes a stichiati that protrudes over to a receptive zone on the minus type gamete. These gametes fuse, escaping their theca as they do so. This initially quadriflagellate zygote resulting from gamete fusion might swim around for a while before making its own new kind of coat. This is now a diploid cell. Non-motile, and it may hang around for a while before going through meiosis within this corrugated coat. And meiosis produces typically four, but sometimes eight, probably through either a premeiotic or a postmeiotic mitosis. Cells that go on to hatch in equal numbers of plus and minus type of course these could go off to uh, participate again in mating fusion and the formation of a zygote. Or they could proceed to uh, multiply asexually, each of them dividing uh, within their theca and uh, hatching out hatching out again in pairs. Uh, as it happens, another root is for these cells to uh, undergo endoreplication. So this is just asexual proliferation, multiplication, endo-replication without mitosis and cytokinesis produces a large cell with extra copies of, uh, of the genome that then goes through by multiple successive cytokineses excuse me, we need to keep its theca on here, multiple successive cytokineses to produce a cyst with a bunch of progeny to hatch out as, once again, little haploid cells. So this is a unicellular life cycle, obviously. Why do this? 
I mentioned before. So this thing is basically hatching out to uh, continue uh, life as little unicellular flagellates. This is a unicellular life history with the complication of the uh, Chlamydomonas type chloroflacians that because their flagelli cannot move within the theca, they have to withdraw them in order to divide. In withdrawing them in order to divide, they cannot swim. If they depend on light, then it behooves them to photosynthesize as much as possible during the day, perhaps going through endoreplication while the light shines, and then going through division, losing their flagella, allowing themselves to sink, and so on, in the dark. So this flagellation constraint imposed by the theca seems to suggest this minor alternation of what's otherwise a standard unicellular life cycle with asexual rape replication punctuated by uh, occasional mating and meiosis. Starting with chlamydomonas-like cells, the chlorophycians include several apparently independently derived groups that have evolved a simple multicellularity culminating in organisms like Volvox. Volvox is a colony of chlamydomonas-like cells, and they have true division of a germline from soma as follows. What I'm drawing here, this outer boundary is a common mucilaginous matrix in which are embedded small chlamydomonas-like flagellates, punctuated occasionally by something else. This is a gonidium It is a future colony, as we'll see. Good grief. Did I really need to draw all of those? Okay, so Volvox might consist, a Volvox colony might consist of a couple thousand little flagellates all working together. Now, one of the ways in which they work together is to swim directionally. Compared to Chlamydomonas, these cells, uh, they have to have a different ciliary beat. If we look at a few of them, they also happen to be connected as they divided at some point, they left little strands behind. So their neighbors through which, in at least some species, they can actually uh, conduct traffic cytoplasm to cytoplasm. Sometimes these connections are very thin. Sometimes they're uh, pretty stout. These cells also communicate or collaborate on a common matrix that they share through which their flagelli protrude. Each of these individuals has uh, an eye spot as or as I recall in the Volvox that I've seen, and somehow they must cooperate to steer the whole thing around. Uh, within the colony, these gonidia go, first go through divisions. These are large cells that go through division and make daughter colonies. This is an asexual process. These daughter colonies form 
with a little hole. And initially, all the flagelli face inward. So if lab students meet Voldox, look for uh, stages in this process because then at some point they undergo an inversion that many people have analogized to uh, gastrulation in animals in which those cells change shape, deform the nascent colony so that by turning the sheet inside out, all of the flagelli will of course point to the outside world. And ultimately, there will be little daughter colonies swimming around in there. Some fraction of these cell divisions will produce a gonidium Again, this is an asexual process. Uh, we haven't talked about sex in Volvox, which also happens under some conditions. These gonidia are triggered to develop uh, either as eggs or as sperm. Uh, and sperm, of course, swim out and fertilize eggs in other colonies. But this asexual process ends when the parent colony ruptures and releases daughter colonies, often several at a time, into the water. So the gonidial cells born within the development of these daughter colonies, the gonidial cells are the germline. They're the equivalent of a, a germline, at least, because all future generations will be descended from them. And of course, during the sexual cycle, they literally are a germline. They make gametes that uh, produces zygote to uh, it during sex. Uh, so the gonidia are the germline. These cells at the periphery are the soma. Um, <clears throat> and they have promised to feed everyone and swim them around, right? and then to die and leave the children in the pond. The premise of uh, some arguments about the origins of this kind of multicellularity in this group is that this is a solution to the kind of flagellation constraint experienced by all of the Chlamydomonas group. That is, by dividing the body into a germ and a soma, Volvox can swim all the time, proliferate, doesn't have to worry about uh, some sort of strategy to uh, budget division for darkness or something like that. And briefly describe another example from a totally different part of the eukaryotic tree, another very simple form of multicellularity is exhibited by uh, cellular slime molds, dictyostelium most famously, but there's a large group of, 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 of these with somewhat diverse strategies. Dictyostelium is a common laboratory model for cell motility, for the genetics of, of uh, of motility and uh, cell polarization, things like that, but also because the cells have the habit of living as individual little amoebas foraging for bacteria in soils, leaf litter, dung, etc. When these individual amoebae start to starve, somebody starts sending out signals. Starving amoebae send signals to each other 
in the form of pulses of cyclic AMP as it happens, and they begin to aggregate. They aggregate into mounds that then rear up as the cells stick together, these so-called slugs, or uh, it actually has a special word, these amoebae get together to make a grex, excuse me, that's supposed to be an E, a grex, which is composed of these amoebae basically piling on top of each other, rolling over each other, and this grex migrates. It migrates somewhere, perhaps toward the light, until it stops and makes a fruiting body. This is a little bit like making a little tiny mushroom. Some part of the grex becomes a uh, uh, sort of a floor plate here, and then a stalk rises up from there. And at the apex, this little bead develops filled with developing spores. Eventually, these, this uh, fruiting body releases the spores. Let's hope it found a good place. All these little amoebae are wandering off looking for food off to the next chalkboard. What's the moral here? Well, here it is. Everyone who made this thing is dead. Okay, and everybody who made these, these have a future. This is the simplest form of the, um, <clears throat> of the basic uh, conundrum of multicellularity. How come some of these cells gave up their future? Now, why they do it at a group level is clear. This, this fruiting body lifts these cells up out of the leaf litter so that they disperse better, okay? But why does any individual choose to participate knowing that it has uh, a good chance of um, being left behind as a dead stalk. Much of the discussion in the literature is around the assumption that these amoebae must be so closely related that they might as well help out each other. And there are various experiments that try mixing lineages to see if some will cheat on others, and of course they do. At any rate, that's one of the basic conundrums of multicellularity, how to develop a strategy that avoids breakdown due to cheating. If they're all supposed to cooperate to do something where only some individuals get the ultimate benefit, whether it's something as simple as this or something somewhat more complicated as in Volvox or even more so in animal bodies, in our life histories, what is the nature of the treaty systems that make this kind of trade-off possible? So how many times has a multicellular lifestyle emerged? There's, uh, there's the slime molds, at least once there, the cellular slime molds. Um, <clears throat> we were talking about Volvox at least once in, in the Chlamydomonas like cells, probably a uh, couple of times, uh, and <clears throat> there are many, many other multicellular lineages within the green algae. Of course, that also includes the land plants.
whose multicellularity is independent from many of the other green lineage experiments in multicellularity. There's the red algae, uh, that's at least once. There's the brown algae, The group, last I looked into it, thinking was there are at least two independent inventions of multicellularity amongst the brown algae, uh, possibly more. Uh, let's not leave out the fungi, which includes at least a couple multicellular uh, derivations. Anybody I'm missing here? Oh, right. Animals, of course. Let's put them on top. Uh, so in the eukaryotic world, there have been perhaps a dozen, at least a dozen experiments in uh, multicellular life, all of which had to have in common a means by which cells hold on to each other, uh, means to direct cell polarity and division, the kinds of things that we covered in the last lecture, differentiate cell types, at least the germ versus the soma, as in Volvox, if there is no other differentiation involved, and to control growth and division. In addition, of course, there has to be a genuine advantage to living together. Now, it's easy to see for animals like us, we're big, we have lots of parts, we can eat pretty much anything we bump into, etc. Uh, but of course, all of these experiments must have started out relatively small, relatively modest. So the advantage of living together must have been significant compared to the opportunities available to individual cells. Perhaps the advantages of division of labor, specializing one cell for one function and another cell for another were sufficient to overcome the disadvantages. Uh, but more important, they all have in common, they all have to have in common mechanisms to prevent cheating. That is, some mechanism to prevent selfish lineages within a multicellular organism from taking over and ruining the whole thing. When cheating lineages arise in animals, what do we call it? We call it cancer. Of course, because of the nature of animal life cycles and their development, it's unusual that cancers can actually take over and invade the germline. Uh, nobody knows of an example of that. Uh, in uh, the slime molds, cheating might take the form of, let's say, uh, piling yourself to the front of the grex so that you uh, are guaranteed to end up in the, in the fruiting body instead of uh, in the stalk. Okay. All of the multicellular strategies somehow open themselves in some way to a vulnerability such as cancer in animals. All right, let's take a look at another simple um, multicellular life cycle. This is an organism familiar to anyone who's been out to the intertidal around here. Olva, we'll start with a haploid thallus. Olva, as many of you probably know, the sea lettuce, grows in big blades attached to something. This blade part that sticks up and waves around, that's the thallus. If you go to parties with phycologists, um, make sure you call the seaweed body, instead of calling it a leaf or a, or a body or something like that, make sure you call it a thallus. That's the rhizoid. Um, now, 
ova has um, isomorphic alternation of generations. I'm going to say what this means in a second, don't worry. In many multicellular eukaryotes, kelps, and green algae, uh, red algae too, both the haploid and the diploid might be able to live in different ways. In the case of ulva, these are isomorphic. That is, you can't really tell the haploid phallus from the diploid phallus. How are these connected? Well, of course, the haploid thing makes gametes. In fact, many of the cells within the phallus can become gametes. Sometime in spring, when you go out to the uh, tide pools here, you might find that they look like uh, someone spilled pea soup in them. That's because the alva blades have started to uh, degenerate into or dissociate into swarms of swimming gametes. Uh, if this happens to be uh, one mating type, let's call it a plus, and it meets a gamete of another mating type, we'll just call it a minus, these fuse. make, of course, a zygote. Which initiates development, a kind of an embryonic development of a little tiny phallus that grows up into a great big sea lettuce, right? Now, incidentally, within this body, it's not like they're complex organs or something. This is really, this uh, thallus is basically just a bilayer of box-like cells held together by cell walls. And about as structurally complex as it gets is that the plastids over here are gonna be on the outside of the blade and so are they over here okay so um, not a terrifically complicated anatomy going on here well how did we get um, gametes of course at some point uh, we had to have meiosis but that takes place in this diploid phallus Producing, producing what? They're not gametes. We're going to give these uh, opposite types. If they're not gametes, they must be spores. because their fate is not to fuse to make a zygote. These haploid spores will go on to initiate development of a new little plant, which grows up into a big haploid uh, sea lettuce like that. Amongst uh, 
phycologists, the haploid plant, which bears gametes, is the gametophyte, the gamete-bearing plant, the diploid one, which bears spores, is the sporophyte. So all that is about as simple as it gets, and it highlights the important role of the one cell bottleneck. So of course, this one went off somewhere to make a, a gametophyte um, that ultimately bore gametes of the opposite mating type, right? Uh, this highlights the importance of the zygote. As close as you get to differentiation here is that some fraction of the cells in the thallus are going to get the privilege of going on to found the next generation, whereas uh, presumably the cells in the rhizoid don't. Of course, um, somebody could cheat, but any cell bearing uh, uh, an allele of a gene that predisposes it to cheating somehow, um, it's either going to uh, arise in the in the thallus and have perhaps a limited future if it goes off to found a colony that in which cells won't bother to attach, right? And they all want to be part of the blade. That doesn't seem like a great strategy. Early in development, coming from the zygote, of course, it's unlikely that such a cheater will have arisen at this stage. The cells that differentiate into the rhizoid versus the thallus early in the embryo are um, genetically identical. So the one cell bottleneck has this important role of limiting cheating uh, amongst other reasons for its persistence and its universality in multicellular life cycles. So ALVA has this very simple uh, multicellular life cycle with isomorphic alternation of multicellular uh, generations, sporophyte and gametophyte, and it's isogamous, that is identical gametes that are produced. Uh, let's use this as the basis for comparison for a moment. First of all, the, um, the animal bigot in me can't help but always feel a little twinge, like somehow I've drawn meiosis in the wrong place here. Uh, isn't meiosis supposed to produce gametes up there? No, this is a version of a generalized eukaryotic life cycle we might uh, consider that there's a diploid phase of some sort, which could multiply through mitosis. That diploid phase may have come about through the fusion of haploid gametes. Let's uh, just for fun make them slightly uh, slightly anisogamous. So it might have come about through fusion of gametes, in which case this is a zygote. Well, uh, what's the connection here? Of course, this diploid phase through meiosis generates what? Well, it generates four haploid cells. What do these do? Well, if they also multiply by mitosis, we call them spores. They could, at some later time, differentiate into gametes.
which were then fused to make a zygote, et cetera. Now, uh, life cycle like ulvas simply means that as this diploid generation goes through division to increase cell numbers, those cells hang together to make a body. And likewise, the spores that come out of um, the uh, meiosis within the, the sporophyte body, they disperse, settle, make their own uh, body that uh, goes through mitosis to greatly increase cell numbers. And some fraction of those, uh, a large fraction as it happens for all the then differentiate as gametes to continue the cycle. The second thing is that it is very common amongst seaweeds for the sporophyte and the gametophyte to differ greatly. An example from the green algae is um, associated with the name Derbesia. That's the name given to the sporophyte. This has heteromorphic alternation of generations. The sporophyte, I think it's the sporophyte, should have checked before uh, lecturing about it. The sporophyte is a, is a branching form in which these, these branches are, are uh, actually syncytial or senocytic, siphonous. These words, a syncytium refers to nuclei sharing a common cytoplasm. And I think it's more or less synonymous with the word senocytic. Uh, and phycologists often say siphonous, referring to the tube of cytoplasm populated by nuclei without any, any partitioning. Of course, uh, they have to partition individual spores and, and even this sporangium in which spores are made is partitioned from the siphonous part of the plant. Supposedly these live around here. Um, I've never met one. At any rate, these spores upon release go off to settle somewhere and each one makes a gametophyte. The gametophyte is different enough that it has a, it's associated with a different genus name historically, Palacistus. It makes these little green balloons that according to what I read, one can find amongst coral and algae. I've never seen them. At any rate, this uh, Halocystis stage, the gametophyte stage, is also senocytic, is also a common cytoplasm populated by many nuclei. At some point, those nuclei must carve themselves out into individual gametes that um, swim off and find each other and fuse to make a new sporophyte. So these two life stages, in this case, occupy different niches. They have very different morphologies. And that implies, of course, that they must have uh, very different developmental programming. There must be uh, different programs running to generate each body form. Incidentally, that's also common for uh, many of the brown seaweeds, the kelps, the big phase that forms you know, forests, Nereocystis or Macrocystis is the sporophyte. The, um, the entire uh, Nereocystis grows in one, in one season, typically from uh, uh, zygote. And by the end of the season, you often find the blades have what looks like a sort of a windowed area in them. That's the region where meiosis is taking place to produce spores, which then uh, swim off and start a gametophyte somewhere. It's a little cryptic plant that I've, I've never seen alive um, that then I presume lives through the cold season and produces gametes that start the cycle over again. So heteromorphic alternation of generations is a rule for 
brown algae and the emphasis on one or another generation varies quite a bit. Fucus, which students taking the lab will hopefully see and see the reproduction of, actually has a life cycle not unlike ours. It has um, a diploid phase that produces eggs and sperm, sometimes from the same plant, sometimes from different plants. So the diploid phase, of course, is the plant that you can find in the, in the algae, uh, excuse me, in the inner tidal growing on rocks. The eggs are big, kind of like the size of a sea urchin egg. The sperm are small. They're kind of uh, these funny little biflagellate things with an eye spot, as it happens. Let's give it an eye spot. And those unite to produce a zygote that grows up into the rockweed. So that brown algal group has arrived at a life cycle very similar to the animal life cycle in which spores don't exactly don't really exist.